Good. Good to go. Dr. Bilal, we're ready yep. to start. So. All right. Hello, everyone. This is Bilal Fallah. I am. I will be chairing the political economy and conflict session, and I will also provide. Uh, I will be the discussant for the three papers. Firstly, we will have um, the topic of is the Arab Arab Spring a new dividing line? Experimental ev evidence from four Arab countries. We have. The authors Enji Amin, Mazen Hassan, Sara Mansour, and Andreas uh, Niklish, if I uh, hoping that I pronounce it well. So we will we'll have uh, each paper presented, then I will provide my comments, then I will allow um, for comments from the floor, and then we move on to the next one. So if you please, you can uh, uh, write down your questions on this uh, chat. A window and they can then read them for directly to the authors or presenters. So, um, okay, let's go for the first presentation and we will be having uh, NG who's presenting. I will be presenting. I'm Sara Mansour. Sara Mansour, Ahlan Sara. Okay, thank you very much, Bilal. Thank you, Shireen. You have 10 uh, to 15 minutes, uh, that's what I was told. Okay, so I will start sharing my screen. <clears throat> So can you see it now? Yep. Okay, great. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, uh, I will be presenting a joint work with uh, Inji Amin and Mezen Hassan from Cairo University and Andreas Niklish from the University of Applied Sciences of the Grissons. Uh, our, the title of the paper we will be presenting today is the following, is the Arab Spring a new dividing line? experimental evidence from four Arab countries. So I will start first with the motivation behind our study. Uh, we have realized that all over the world, historical events produce dividing lines that affect social dynamics for years beyond the triggering events. So for example, if we look at Europe, uh, major transformations toward nation state building and democratization processes have placed different social groups in opposition to one another. And then when environmental issues, disarmament, immigration, and globalization rose to the fore as new issues, we realized that new dividing lines emerged. The Arab world is no exception in this. So we can see that in the Arab world, there is the Shia-Sunni divide, which is also a product of a 1,400-year-old event. We also found out that the end of the Ottoman Caliphate contributed to the creation of the Islamist secular divide. So what is clear about all these examples is that the more salient the event is, or the more socially divisive it is, the greater role it plays in forming and reshaping the attitudes of the individuals. So looking at the Arab Spring, past decade, rising views around its classification. So by looking at this figure, for example, which is the, the, the result of a mass survey conducted in 2014 in six Arab Spring countries, Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco, Libya, Jordan, and Iraq, on representative samples, we found out, as you can see, that in only two of the six Arab Spring countries, which are Egypt and Tunisia, there is a majority behind a single labeling of the Arab Spring, which they call the revolu a revolution. However, even in these two countries, there is a significant proportion of the population uh, who uh, call the Arab Spring or give it ne negative labeling, like Arab destruction or sometimes conspiracy against Arabs. And in the Arab four Arab Spring countries, we find that there is no majority over the labeling of the Arab Spring, whether it is negative or positive. Also in Egypt, uh, even classifying the Arab Spring events in the draft of the 2014 constitution generated backlash. And the, there was this incident where one of the MPs refused to take the oath just be because 
the, the Arab Spring was referred to in the constitution as a revolution. So this shows us that uh, the Arab Spring uh, fits very, very well into our definition of a potential source of a dividing line with uh, the result of affecting the uh, socioeconomic attitudes of the populations of the relevant countries. Accordingly, our research question is the following. We try to examine how far Arab Spring events have generated a new dividing line in the region, affecting the socioeconomic attitudes of the populations of the Arab Spring countries, and whether such division depends on how violent Arab Spring events have been. So what is the theory and our hypotheses? First, what is a dividing line? Dividing lines are deep and lasting divisions between groups based on some kind of conflict. And if we look at the literature, the early literature has focused on dividing lines pertaining to class, religion, or language. Subsequent studies also focused on non-sociological issues like abortion, gender roles, and democratic authoritarian attitudes. And if we zoomed in on the Arab world, there have been multiple views on what sort of dividing lines exist post 2011 Arab Spring. One view, for example, considers the, the, the Arab Spring as a new wave of the Islamist secular divide. Another view sees the ongoing divisions as more of issue based, pertaining to the economy, culture, and internal politics of individual countries. Whatever it is, we found out that polarizing historical events provide the narrative that tells us who we are and defines a trajectory that constructs groups' identity. And if salient enough, they lock actors into opposing camps based on their views, making it not only hard to change camps ex post, but also generating what is called uh, confirmation biases, whereby a body of reasoning makes earlier views stick. This drives us to our first hypothesis, which is the following. Disagreement over Arab Spring events have produced a division that affects the socioeconomic attitudes of individuals of these Arab Spring countries. Our second argument pertains to the intensity of the events. We argue that more violent Arab Spring events, like those countries that have faced civil wars following the Arab Spring, are more likely to produce stronger dividing lines because of the magnitude of the losses, be they material or non-material losses, that uh, the events entail. This moves us to our second hypothesis, which is war-torn countries are more likely to exhibit stronger division that affects socioeconomic attitudes. So what is our methodology? The methodology that we relied on in order to test our two hypotheses is lab and lab in the field experiments that were conducted in 2018 and 2020 with a total of 1034 subjects. Our experiments were fielded in four Arab Spring countries that represent varying outcomes of the Arab Spring event, ranging from Tunisia, where there has been relatively more consolidated transition, to Jordan, where uh, there was muted protests, to Egypt, where a turbulent transition happened, and then to Syria, where uh, a civil war occurred following the Arab Spring. For our Syrian sample, which uh, consisted of 326 Syrians who were recruited from Zaatari refugee camp in Jordan, and this, this is a photo for uh, a live photo that uh, uh, we took on the borders between Jordan and Syria, which is very close to the Zaatari camp where we conducted our uh, lab in the field experiment on Syrian refugees. And this is another photo for the real lab in the field experiment that took place inside the camp. So this Zaatari camp, let me tell you briefly uh, some information about this Zaatari camp. So it is one of the largest refugee camps for Syrians in Jordan located about 10 kilometers away from the Syrian border. Uh, it was first opened in 2012 and uh, by 2018, where we conducted the, the experiments, it had nearly 80,000 Syrian refugees. 
for our Jordanian, Tunisian, and Egyptian experiments, they were conducted in three big public universities in Cairo University in Egypt, in Yarmouk University in Jordan, and in Manuba University in Tunisia. All experiments were run on tablet computers. Each of the 1,034 subjects participated in the experiment only once. After the experiments, all subjects took place, uh, took part in a post-experiment questionnaire, uh, having questions about demographics and trauma questions and political attitudes. And in order to examine or to test our hypotheses, which is uh, the impact of uh, the Arab Spring on the uh, socioeconomic behavior of our subjects, uh, we had to uh, divide our subjects into, uh, or to, to get information about our subjects' uh, views on the Arab Spring. So in order to examine the impact of a partner's views of the Arab Spring on our dependent variable, which is pro-social behavior of our subjects, uh, either altruism or trust, we had to label the Arab Spring events to our subjects. And we prefer not to interpret or interfere in what our subjects understood under that broad concept of the Arab Spring. That's why we use the term, the events that the Arab world has seen in 2011. How did we measure this? At the beginning of the experiment, subjects were asked the following question. How do you evaluate the events of the Arab world uh, the Arab world has seen in 2011? And accordingly, based on their answers, subjects were then matched with another subject who has either an opposing view of the Arab Spring or the same view of the Arab Spring. Sarah, I've got five minutes left. Okay, sure. <laughs> As we wanted to test how far our hypothesized dividing line affected the behavior within Arab countries as well as across the Arab world, we designed our treatments to take place on both levels, at the na national level and pan-Arab level. That's why we had four treatments where the subject is either playing versus fellow national or playing versus fellow national with opposing views on the Arab Spring or playing versus fellow Arab or playing versus fellow Arab with opposing views on the Arab Spring. All subjects play two experimental games in order to improve social behavior, which are the dictator game and the trust game. And the experimental manipulation was varying the game partner to be either a fellow national or an Arab who holds either an opposite view of the Arab Spring or the same view to the subject of the Arab Spring. And the games were fielded relying on the strategy method in order to ensure sufficient statistical power for a wide variety of strategies. We used between subjects design in which each subject was exposed to one and only one treatment. And there was in-session randomization of the treatments where each subject was assigned randomly by the computer to one of our four treatments. Okay, so this was just uh, for those who were not familiar with the dictator game, it was just an explanation of the dictator game, but I don't think I have enough time to uh, explain it, but we can do this in the discussion, of course. And the other one is the trust game which is another explanation of the second game that our subjects played. Okay, points collected by each subject were transformed into cash payments privately at the end of the experimental session. And this shows that it was done privately. Okay, so sample descriptives. Before looking at the results of our experimental games, this table shows us uh, an overview of the characteristics of the samples. So our Syrian and Jordanian sample were had a major had a balanced uh, gender representation, whereas the Egyptian sample was had a female majority and the Tunisian sample had a male majority. The average age was twenties uh, in the Egyptian, Tunisian, and Jordanian sample because our sample was a student sample. For the Syrian sample, the average age was 30 because it was uh, a non-student sample. Mm -hmm. Let me now move very quickly to the uh, results of our experimental games. Okay, uh, uh, first we analyzed the trust game. Okay, and as you can see from this figure, 
uh, we were trying to measure the, uh, the low trust, the proportion of individuals uh, who uh, exhibited low trust. Low trust means that subjects who chose to send either zero or 50 points to the gaming partner. And as you can see from this figure, there is significant difference only for the Syrian sample, where in the Syrian sample, uh, the proportion of low trust is significantly higher when matched with a national of a different view than when matched with a national with no view mentioned. This result is confirmed when we control for uh, our set of controls like age, gender, and income and education, okay? And it is also clear that uh, for the Syrian sample, uh, low trust significantly increases when a Syrian is playing with a fellow Syrian who has opposing views of the Arab Spring. By looking at the dictator game, which is our second game, okay, we also find that in the Syrian sample, there is a significant uh, difference between Syrians who are playing with Syrians who have opposing views uh, and Syrians who are playing with Syrians with the same views about the Arab Spring. So it is clear from the second bar that uh, Syrians are, become less altruists, significantly less altruistic when they play versus Syrians who have opposing views of the Arab Spring. And this result, this result is also confirmed by doing a regression analysis and controlling for our set of controls. Uh, and this proves our second hypothesis, which is that for war-torn countries and countries in the Arab Spring that have faced a civil war, uh, these are the countries where uh, the socioeconomic behavior of its individuals is uh, negatively affected by the Arab Spring events and uh, they show uh, signs of a dividing line uh, between the different segments of the population who share opposing views on the Arab Spring. Okay, so I'm done, Bilal, I hope just in time. Thanks for being timely, like 20, 20 seconds of the time limit. But thank you very much. Thank you. It was a very nice presentation. Thank okay, you. I'll do my job now. Um, just let me just let me share my, I have my comments in, PowerPoint presentation. Should I stop sharing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. All right. Okay, so let me just recap the, uh, the research objectives, methodology, and findings. So the authors wanted to examine to what extent the Arab Spring events created new divide, what they called new dividing line in the region with respect to socioeconomic behavior biases, with respect to altruism and trust. Uh, it also examines if the division is related to the magnitude of the violence, focusing, like focusing on the Syrian sample. Uh, the methodology, it's um, uh, a lab in, and lab in the field experiment with subjects from four different countries. One that I mentioned, Syria, we have Jordan, uh, Tunisian and Egyptians. Um, so the experiment is based on tracing whether subjects exhibit biases based on partners' view of the Arab Spring events. As for the findings, uh, the authors show uh, statistically significant results only among uh, the Syrians and only among the games in which um, uh, Syrian is playing against a fellow Syrian nationals with different view on Arab Spring. So that um, uh, the results has to do with a reduced level of Trust. The authors claim that the finding is driven by magnitude of violence took place in Syria. Firstly, I'm really happy to see uh, a new line of research methodology being done in, the, in this region, in the Arab region, like experiment. And I, I feel very, very much uh, you know, uh, happy about it, that the new researchers are taking uh, the lead in this kind of research. And I thought that this is, uh, this is a plus. Uh, the research topic is also very relevant and timely, um, you know, given the political divisions we are facing uh, in many countries due to uh, the, the repercussions of the Arab uh, Springs. Um, however, I think there are um, a number of issues that need to be revised so that we, we make sure uh, the findings are robust and um, uh, are supported by theory. So I have a, a 
a, a number of issues here, uh, a theory. Uh, uh, the authors provided a good story about um, uh, the division in the Arabic, uh, Arab world, post the, um, um, the Arab Spring. Uh, they also uh, discussed some literature on how major polarizing events change people's attitude. But there was no reference or no theory supporting the linkages between the dividing lines and the altruism and trust. And I thought this is very important to discuss. This is as far as the uh, uh, theory uh, uh, is concerned. So, and the other th issue is related to the empirical implementation. Clearly the sample used um, uh, in this experiment is, is non-random. Uh, so, um, uh, as uh, um, Sarah mentioned, um, the, the size of the sample differs across countries. Uh, we have many of them are young. The females are more representative in Egypt. The point is, I mean, um, the, the findings or the main message of the paper tend to generalize. So um, uh, I'm quoting here, um, um, the purpose of the paper was to, uh, was to understand how much Arab Spring events has affected the, cover, the current fault lines of the Arab world. So there is a tendency to generalize. I'm not sure if we can, uh, we can generalize the findings documented in the paper since the random, uh, since the sample, I'm sorry, is, is non-random. So I, I think we have to be more careful on the generalizing issue. Uh, the setting of the experiment. Um, I think there, there was no uh, careful um, controlling for the uh, setting of the experiment. For example, we have the Syrians, all of them from Z residing in Zatar camp, and we have other players residing in own, on own countries. So the setting is different. So the question then becomes to what extent the setting affects the uh, 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 people's attitude. Um, is it possible that the, the findings you show on the Syrian sample uh, are related to what I call the camp effect, the grievances from living in miserably in a camp event? Would the results be robust if we uh, have players, Syrian players living in Sweden, for example? Um, this is what, uh, uh, as for controlling the sitting of the experiment. Other, another issue is magnitude of violence. Um, you conclude that, um, or explain why uh, the uh, significant results show up in the Syrian sample as due to the uh, magnitude of violence. And this is your own interpretation. Uh, violence was not directly measured. We, it could be, but, but, but we don't know if it is driven by violence. It could be uh, driven by some other factors that you're not controlling in, in Regression. For example, it could be related to some personal experience or what we call in kinematics some individual fixed effect. Okay, that drives your results. So um, I'm suggesting one way to control for the latter for individual fixed effect is to run a model pooling the data from uh, for all subjects across experiments. You have, uh, I noticed you have three experiments playing with a fellow national uh, uh, against fellow national. Uh, with different view and playing uh, versus uh, fellow Arab. So you can pull the, 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 the outcomes of these three experiments and this can allow you to control for individual fixed effects. And you can see then how robust are the, the results. And the last comment I have for you is, um, uh, some findings lack explanation. For example, you showed that for the Syrian um, experiment, it's only significant when it's Syrian versus Syrian. And it's insignificant when play when the game is between Syrian and fellow Arab. Uh, uh, this this needs to be uh, uh, explained. Why is there something about, uh, uh, I'm sorry, unique about the Syrians and their at the attitude among each other? Um, yeah, that's about it for me. But I thought that the, 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 the paper was 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 nicely done. Now um, I want to see if we have questions. Uh, Q&A, I don't have uh, no open questions. I, I don't see any, but if you wanna address uh, one or a couple of my comments, uh, I'll give you a chance. Uh, yeah, okay. 
And any, any, uh, I hear some somebody. Yeah, in... yeah. Uh, hello, Dr. Bilal, uh, Ali Fakir. I have. Hello, uh, Ali. You have a question. Yeah, I have a quick question. Thank you, sir. Right, but guys, please write uh, up your uh, raise your. Uh, Ali raised his hand. I'm sorry, I did not see that. Go ahead, yeah. Ali. Uh, uh, maybe they are not significant at, uh, because uh, sample is a small and like you mentioned, it's not uh, purely random. That's why uh, they are less accurate. So if you, know, if you compare colons in the last slide, the coefficient in the last colon increases and also the standard error uh, proportionally more. So leading to insignificant outcomes. So maybe because of the sample size, not random or whatever. Uh, leading to this insignificant outcome uh, in the variables. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Uh, okay, Sarah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Bilal, and thank you, Ali, for the comments. I have, of course, written them down, and I will uh, try to incorporate them in the final version of the paper. Yeah, I agree with you that uh, uh, the literature is uh, short, with regard to the polarizing events and their impact on altruism and trust. Because uh, altruism and trust, they have been measured in the literature using surveys, self-reported attitudes. Uh, but there is no big literature using experiments, okay, to measure the impact of polarizing events on altruism and trust, which I believe is uh, a shortage in the literature. And this is where our paper uh, tries to bridge this gap. So uh, I hope that this will be a good contribution for our paper to add to the literature by measuring the impact of uh, events that are uh, so polarizing like the Arab Spring and how they affect the socioeconomic behavior of uh, the different populations, like the impact on cooperation, on altruism, on trust and so on. So this should be a good contribution, hopefully. Uh, the sample not being random I think you mean that the sample is not being representative, right? Because we have done a randomization of uh, our participants among the different treatments. So randomization is fulfilled, but the random is not representative, which is uh, a normal thing in experiments because in experiments, we are not seeking to have representative samples. Representative samples are mainly uh, an outcome of surveys. Uh, Ways have a limitation because they just measure self report About experiments is that we compare a treatment to a control. And that's why the effect, the, ad, the average treatment effect is uh, usually trustworthy because we are just comparing two settings that are uh, similar in each aspect, except for the intervention that we introduce. So, uh, I, I'm, I'm not concerned about not having a representative sample, uh, but maybe uh, you, what you said about the Syrian sample and the, the fact that uh, the Syrians were uh, residing in a camp, uh, th th this was normal because we couldn't reach Syrians living in Syria, of course, for logistical reasons, and uh, we had to access them uh, where they live. Uh, but I believe that the Syrians living in camps are uh, a better sample than going to Syrians living in Switzerland or Germany, for example, because uh, there will be selection bias. Uh, those who went to Germany or flew to Switzerland are the well-off Syrians. So they are not the ones whom we are targeting, whom, uh, who have uh, been hardly hit by the civil war in Syria. So I think those living in camp, there, there might be an impact of the camp, of course. And this is what is confirming our, uh, what we call the magnitude of the Arab Spring or the civil war. So it is, uh, I hope it is well measured by those living in the camp. Uh, but we can definitely uh, refer to this as maybe uh, something that uh, has to be referred to uh, with regard to the analysis. Uh, yes, uh, we will definitely do this pooling of the data that you suggested in order to uh, uh, control for the individual fixed effects. Um, the Syrian versus the Syrian uh, and the Syrian versus the Arab. This is, I think, another robustness, robustness check of our result that it was found that uh, when Syrians play versus Arabs who have opposing views, they are not that 
low trusting and uh, uh, egoists as when they play versus fellow nationals. So this is a confirmation that really uh, the Arab Spring is generating this dividing line on the national level. It was not uh, confirmed on the pan-Arab level. So it's just on the national level and only the result is coming from Syria where the level of the Arab Spring has been very uh, devastating. Uh, uh, yes, maybe uh, as Ali mentioned, uh, I think yes, the, the sample size could be uh, uh, behind the, the insignificance of some results, but uh, uh, we, ha we have no other <laughs> solution to this. Maybe, uh, maybe we, uh, I don't think we can uh, get a, a bigger sample now. Uh, and, but, but this can be referred to in the conclusion, of course. Right, thank you very much, Sarah. Thank but one point in, on the sample, on the random issues, I'm aware that you was, uh, the, the selection to treatment was random, was random, mm -hmm. that's fine. But then exactly. this addresses the internal validity threat, but you'll have to address the external validity threat, which is to what extent the entire sample, all the players are representing the entire population. That's what I meant. Yeah, Anyways, okay. thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you very much. Now we'll move to uh, the second presentation. Unconditional cash-based assistance to the poor. What do at scale programs achieve by Onur uh, Altendag and Stephen Connell? All right. We can, you can guys start now. All right. Let me... Uh... I can't. Uh, I can't share the screen. It says. Oh, you have to stop sharing. Hold yeah. on. Go ahead. All right. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Yes. We All can. right. Thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here, and thank you for uh, for the invitation. Uh, my co-author is here. Steve is here. So, if you have any questions, please. He will be monitoring the uh, chat. So. So. Uh, in this paper is about cash interventions and, and you know, they're very popular to address uh, 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 poverty traps. They're easy to implement, they're transparent, and, and they're kind of popular because they directly address the, the credit constraints, which are considered to be the cornerstone of uh, poverty traps. So they, they satisfy, they help families, impoverished families to satisfy basic needs. They have potential to also generate savings and re reduce reliance on expensive credit. And in other words, these interventions also, uh, cash-based cash interventions have potential to actually create a virtuous cycle to, uh, to move uh, households to a better uh, equilibrium. But you might have an alternative approach in which if you consider poverty as a multidimensional and complex uh, trap, then addressing just one side of, and one big side, but one side of the credit constraints might not be enough to uh, lift uh, have sustained effects on, on, uh, on uh, uh, alleviating poverty. So this paper kind of sits uh, on, on this long lasting and, and, uh, and kind of uh, important question, which is the, if the cash-based interventions are tools for only for temporary relief and, or, or might they provide uh, sustained poverty alleviation. And we're gonna test this in, in, uh, in a uh, forced displacement setting. We're gonna look at the during and after program effects of uh, of two large cash-based programs, uh, and and what we uh, what we try to do here is that we show the program effects, uh, but but we we kind of fail uh, to to show using the same exact setting that they they fail to persist even six months after the program ends, and we try to explain why. Uh, we focus on two. Uh, large cash transfer programs provided to uh, Syrian refugees in Lebanon uh, over, uh, it's spread over 12 months, it's a yearly program and the transfer values are huge. You can see these numbers, uh, you know, uh, about 2000 and one oh, around $1,600 per, per year over 12 months. And they're larger than most of the uh, cash assistance programs that are analyzed in the literature. And they also, uh, the, the, the sums are uh, relative, uh, relatively speaking, they also, the transfers are large. Uh, they correspond to around 40 to 50% of the contractual expenditure. It's sufficient to have sustained effects. In uh, refugee population, uh, Lebanon. Uh, so, you know, 
there are similarities and differences with the typical uh, impoverished uh, population targeted by these programs in other country settings. They lack assets, they're excluded from institutions, most of the, uh, especially uh, labor market and, and, uh, and financial institutions. They are recent immigrants and they have exposure to uh, conflict. Uh, so all these things, if you think about the multidimensional aspect of vulnerability, uh, you know, having uh, th this set of case where there's very limited access to other markets might actually uh, make the cash tra transfers less effective than it would have in, in other settings. So uh, that, that are the specifics uh, for our population that we're interested in. Um, so we, what we show is that, you know, we're going to show immediate substantial effects of these programs uh, that, that is in line with the documented uh, literature. Uh, but these beneficiaries, we show that they actually unable to smooth consumption. And even at six months, the, the consumption levels go back to where it started. Uh, and, and, you know, despite the fact that these programs are large enough to ease the liquidity and credit constraints, uh, we show that this is not because of myopic behavior. Uh, uh, refugees spend money in, in basic needs. Uh, and, and or we show that, you know, the transfer values are large. So the initial impacts are large too. And also we show that the term stru structure doesn't matter. In other words, you can be a continuous beneficiary or you might have never received assistance before. It doesn't matter at the end of the program cycle, you go back to where you began. Uh, and and our in, in, in our analysis, kind of we have a detailed analysis of asset holdings and savings in the paper. What we show is that it's probably the, the high volatility that these families are experiencing in Lebanon that actually they try to save and they try to smooth consumption uh, in terms of like they save cash and durable goods, but they these goods are liquidated within months uh, due to uh, due to the frequent uh, shocks, uh, income shocks that. Uh, that the uh, beneficiaries receive. Um, and this is not an experimental study, but, but still we, we have fully pre-specified it uh, uh, with everything, the sample specifications and so on, on uh, Open Science Foundation before uh, we had access to, uh, access to data. So there was little room for us to kind of uh, cherry pick the results that I'm gonna show you today. Um, I'm going to maybe skip this uh, country context. I think we're all familiar. Uh, uh, Syrian refugees in Syria have a large family size, relatively speaking, uh, uh, roughly equal in gender, uh, very young uh, and, and relatively uneducated. And the medium family will live on a $2 per day uh, poverty line. There are no camps in Lebanon for historical reasons. I think we can, uh, we all here uh, know why. And, uh, and, we are looking at the cash-based transfer programs uh, provided by UN agencies and the impl other implementing agencies in the region. Uh, these programs are large. They, they reach to the 50% of the refugee population. We're gonna be analyzing two programs. One is multi-purpose cash assistance provided by uh, UNHCR and WFP that provides $175 per month to unrestricted uh, independent of the family size. And it covers the poorest 60,000 households. And then we also look at the food program that provides 70, uh, $27 per person per month, and you have to multiply it with the family size. And, and, and this, the second, the food program is a little more generous. So it covered all 60,000 families who also receive multi-purpose cash. And on the top of that, uh, it, it reaches to another 60,000 households and provide uh, food assistance. So, it's the program is is targeted based on a poverty means test. So so the basic idea is that to come up with a prediction model that that ranks families from poor, from the most vulnerable to least vulnerable and allocate the resources based on uh, based on that ranking and and it depends on on the the number of households exact households that are rich depends on the yearly budget. So every year this re, uh, this cycle restarts. And, and, and the families are re-ranked again. And then the program kind of bottom up helps to the number of families that it can within the given budget. And the scores are unknown. These scores, uh, poverty scores or vulnerability scores are unknown to refugees or even the field offices. So that will be like only the uh, central office who will know uh, what, what, uh, what the uh, poverty score of, of 
uh, of a family is who makes them eligible or uneligible. So there are two discontinuities that we're going to take care of. The one is the multi-purpose cash assistance. You can see this program will help the first 60,000 families, and then the next family wouldn't be able to receive in this hypothetical example because of the fact that the budget is lower and that this program only can cover the bottom 60,000 or so families. And the next one is the food program. This the second discontinuity that you can see here. Obviously, this program uh, uh, values depends on the family size because of the food program. So you can see here that the food program will roughly every year would cover 120,000 families. And the next family here, right here, uh, wouldn't be eligible because, uh, because of the program limits. So that will be the two large discontinuities that we use. Uh, we're going to look at uh, a, a wide set of outcomes using data from uh, four years of survey. Uh, conducted in Syria that assess the vulnerability of Syrian refugees. Uh, we look at expenditure and well-being measures. Uh, uh, and then we also use uh, link the survey data to, uh, to administrative data of the UNHCR to, to get the scores. And we have the history of a score of each household. So we can actually, as long as the families were in, in Lebanon, we can observe their poverty present in the country. So we can go back one year, two years, and three in, uh, in Lebanon. So we look at consumption, we look at child well-being, we look at health outcomes, we look at food insecurity and livelihood coping strategies. Uh, we also look at the cash savings and, 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 and asset accumulation. Uh, to be able to kind of observe to the extent that we can the, uh, the saving behavior. We, we have two time horizons. We look at the during program and after program effects. The during program effects are, are observed. So these data is collected six months after the program begins. So families that we observe who are eligible will be still receiving assistance at the time of the data collection. And we also report uh, what we call after program effects, which is basically uh, the outcomes are observed 18 months after the programs begin. So the program cycle is one year. So this is six months after the families received their last installment of, of assistance. So the households who, who are in our like sort of treatment group in this after program effect reports, they, they at the time of the data collection, they would not be receiving assistance over the last six months. But cumulatively speaking, they had received assistance over the 18 months, uh, much more than uh, those who were not uh, uh, eligible. So, and this gives us, you know, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but this is, this gives us the standard setting for a regression discontinuity design, where we're gonna take, uh, we're gonna take families, and, in, and you know, uh, this is the falsification test that we can, you know, I, I want for the, uh, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna talk, but you can see it in here that. You know, this is just like standardized threshold for each year and the pooled data. You can see that, you know, the program is almost religiously assigning the, the, the beneficiaries uh, based on these yearly thresholds. And, and, you know, and these families here on the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the eligibility threshold are quite similar as we show in the data. Uh, they are identical, so this creates sort of a natural experiment around this local uh, local eligibility threshold, and that's what we're going to be using here. And these are the uh, during program first stage effects, like the uh, the uh, y-axis here is the cumulative amount of monthly average transfer, and then here you can see even if you look at one year after the program ends, uh, the families who were just right uh, of the threshold have on on average have received a, a much larger amount of assistance over the last 18 months compared to families who were just below the threshold and were not eligible. And this holds for each program. And we have the standard RD tests that, uh, that show that the basically around the, this threshold, the, the assignment is as good as random. So now, you know, you can see that, you know, here is the multi-purpose, the first program, the cash program, and here is the, the bottom is the, is the food program. Uh, and, and you can see here is that this is the consumption in log terms. The consumption goes down as the families uh, 
uh, approach to the threshold, which just means that the program is working. In other words, the consumption is, the expenditure is going down as families become more and more closer to the eligibility threshold. But you can see here the discrete jump, which is, you know, depending on the specification, this is 15 to 20% increase in consumption. And this is due to the fact that the families are receiving assistance and they can spend it for basic, uh, basic needs. Uh, but this is the during program effect. So this is six months after the program begins. There's huge increase in consumption. I mean, substantial increase in consumption. And then once the program ends, we're looking at the 18 months uh, after the beginning of the program and the six months after the program ends, you can see that you know these effects are actually almost negative. So uh, you can see null effects on, on consumption. And for food, we don't find much of a consumption effect. It's, it's very muted, but we see in the paper that uh, the food expenditure effects are actually quite large. Uh, we find improvements in child uh, 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 child hardship index, which is you know child labor and and school enrollment uh, and early marriage, child marriage. So we sh we see all kinds of improvements in this child hardship index for the multi-purpose cash program. But again, once the program ends, six months after the program, these effects uh, uh, are completely muted, and we don't find any impact on on uh, child well-being for the uh, for the food program. Um, health and healthcare access, we have null effects. This is because of the fact that probably there are already health and healthcare access programs that exist and provided through UNHCR in Lebanon that are specific to refugees. Food coping strategies, uh, multi-purpose cash program has a little bit uh, of impact, but that's muted and no impact after the, after the program ends. Food program provides substantial relief on, on, on easing the food coping, negative food coping strategies. You can see these are substantial effects and these are ITT effects, intended treat effects. Uh, and, and, and again, you know, six months after the program ends, these effects completely, uh, completely disappear. And the same trend for livelihood coping strategies. You can see that these strategies, negative strategies drop substantially. There's improvement in, uh, in, in these vulnerabilities uh, through, the, through both programs. And again, large effect sizes. And then we go back to, uh, we go back to uh, zero. Uh, uh, six months after the program ends. So we have limited measures. I mean, I'm not gonna spend, I think I'm running out of time here, uh, but what we show in the paper is that these families actually try to save money. Uh, there is saving during the program, but these savings are spent to cope with uh, income shocks. And we also sh show not only they try to, the families try to save money, but they also try to save in terms of uh, durable goods, but these durable goods also liquidated after the program ends, which are kind of corresponds to the fact that there's something going on with the fam with these families. They have to kind of liquidate the, the savings that they accumulated when they were receiving the assistance. And this is true for both food and the multi-purpose cash. And we also show that the term structure doesn't matter. We split the data by for all outcomes. We have done this for for families who have never received assistance before, the effect sizes are very similar for families who were uh, who were receiving assistance and who were discontinued. So, uh, why why do effects not persist? It's not myopic behavior. We show that families don't spend the, the money on on temptation goods. You know, children taking care of work, they back to school, their cash savings, the purchase of durable goods. So, families are trying to to kind of smooth consumption. Uh, transfer amounts are large, so duration is not also the issue. So what is left for us is that really the shocks that they receive during after, which uh, makes the program effects uh, uh, once once the cycle is over. So here are the say uh, I'm not going to take more time, but here are the summary if you if you're interested in. And thank you so much for. Uh, for listening to this. Thank you very much, Honor, for uh, the very nice presentation. Please uh, stop sharing so that I can see All share right. my, my screen. All right. Yep. So let me just... Uh, I recall the main uh, stuff of this research. So it's about examining the effect of large temporary income changes on a number of welfare indicators, including consumption patterns, food insecurity, coping strategy, child well-being, and health among Syrian refugees in Jordan. 
the methodology is um, uh, uh, discontinuity research discontinuity design, mainly fuzzy, uh, the fuzzy uh, type of it. Uh, the main findings, they show that unconditional cash transfer program, about 2,100, and for food voucher 16, how about 1,600, increased contemporaneous expenditure by 20% and 10% respectively. Uh, both programs generate immediate uh, positive effect on child well-being, food security, coping strategies. Nonetheless, the positive effect, here's what matters, I guess, the most in this uh, finding, the positive effects are short-lived. No effect detected six, six months after the cash transfer is over. Beneficiaries tend to liquidate assets uh, accumulated um, soon after the program ends. So the takeaway message, and I'm quoting here, effects are similar for new and continuing beneficiary, suggesting that the length of assistance cycle does not increase consumption smoothly. These findings are consistent with the highly volatile economic environment in which large asset transfer may un um, unable to yield sustained improvements in the well-being. So I thought the paper is well written. The flow of argument is very smooth. So I really congratulate you on that, guys. Uh, the empirical methodology is, uh, you know, fits the research case and is very well implemented. The findings are, are also generally supported by a number of robustness checks. However, I have a number of issues and I thought, I think if you address them, this will just enrich the uh, findings of your paper. So the first issue here is research context and contribution. So I, uh, and reading your paper, guys, um, I, uh, I saw that you situated your paper as belonging to certain lit literature that link between unconditional transfers in general and poverty elevation. Um, you, uh, the paper goes on in the introduction discussing how credit constraints is, a, is, is you know, uh, making uh, poor even deeper and how the effect of unconditional cash transfer improve the well-being of households. Then it's understood that, that uh, uh, the main contribution of your paper is, aside from the methodology, is to investigate the sustainability of the uh, intervention improvement. Uh, however, um, I think, um, to my understanding, these cash, uh, uh, unconditional cash programs are, at la are generally uh, emergency cash programs. And such programs are usually utilized to, to temporarily ease hardship among uh, you know, the beneficiaries. And here we talk about the Syrian refugees. Uh, uh, and you, show, you guys show in the paper that most of the money, the transfer, ca cash transfer, is spent in basic needs as well as durable goods. Uh, so to me, there's no surprises. The positive effect is expected just to last uh, to the extent that they, the, the, the beneficiaries uh, have money to spend, and one, once the money is over, we revert to the uh, initial conditions. So in this context, um, I'm not really sure if the case study you are presenting in your paper, and this is not to undermine the, the methodology or the finance, it's very important, and I would like to stress that again, but providing evidence on uh, linking the sustainability of improvement of the unconditional cash transfer. Um, I don't think your case fits this, you know, very general kind of uh, takeaway message. Ideally, I would look, and, and I mean, I would look into experiments uh, that uh, contains um, spending on productive assets. So for such programs designed to uh, assist the beneficiaries on acquiring productive assets, then we would expect that the improvement will last and there will be surprise, surprise if it is not lasting. So this is my, my first comment. Uh, the other comments are on the uh, validity of the RDD methodology. Um, your sample is the Syrian refugees in Lebanon. I mean, at large, almost all of them are in need of assistance. So we expect that almost uh, or most of them are, are actually receiving some assistance some way or another, even those who are in the control of your group of your uh, experiment. Uh, this is my hunch. I mean, this could be 
true, could be wrong, but this is like from my understanding and reading and, uh, you know, doing some reports on the uh, livelihood of the refugees, whether they are in Jordan or Lebanon or elsewhere. So I, I think uh, if they do get assistance from elsewhere, I think, yeah, you know, it would be hard to isolate the effect of uh, the treatment effect. Uh, I think this this needs to be addressed as, uh, 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 you know, a likely limitation of this. Uh, the other thing is you uh, you guys used fuzzy uh, uh, RDD model using the IV to address the non non, non compliance, uh, but this you know it comes at the expense of losing uh, observations. Okay, so here we talk about the power of the test, the vicinity of the cutoff score, um, and I thought this may might be discussed in the paper. Another issue is with uh, child will well being. I, I I found it a little bit uh, maybe surprising that uh, uh, you know after the uh, six months after the program is over. So you are saying that uh, households are uh, pulling their kids out of schools. Um, I'm not saying this is this is awkward, but this was a little bit surprising to me. Uh, anyways. Uh, what was not clear to me from the reading the paper, how the uh, characters uh, about the characteristics of the, uh, the control and the uh, treated groups. Are you guys controlling between house, uh, households with children at age schools in both samples? Uh, this was not clear, so I, I thought you, would, uh, you should highlight that. Another issue is with the self-reporting. You know, uh, it's, we'll always have limitation with self-reporting, self but uh, even if you, you emphasize that in the paper, you said that um, the beneficiaries or potential beneficiaries don't know the cutoff, they don't know, uh, the, even the workers don't have information about the cutoffs and so forth, but people tend to learn after the first cycle, right? So if they learn uh, um, from their uh, behavior, from their if they, if they learn from uh, the treated groups who uh, got the assistance in the first circle, then they might strategize on the second circle. So I thought this could be discussed further in the uh, paper. I also have other comments. Um, so uh, uh, um, if you can explain what are the source of non-compliance uh, that led you to use the fuzzy regression. And there's also um, you know, some issues related to uh, the uh, documentation in the figures. Uh, and the last thing, um, as a robustness check, I, I suggest you, you guys, you can use different functional forms just to ensure that the uh, results are robust. I'm done, but I, I would like to give some credit to my uh, friend and colleague, Sam, Hall Sam uh, Hallaq, who, because I have three papers to, you know, to review, I, I had to get his opinion on these papers by different and thank you very much. And I thought it's well done paper, and it's, it's, I really enjoyed reading it. So I have we have uh, we have somebody we have Sarah raising her hand. So I'm gonna give Sarah uh, the floor to uh, ask her question, and then we will get back to you. Honor, if you want to address the mic uh, comments as well as Sarah's. Of course, or yeah. Comments. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Bilal. Uh, thank you, Honor, for the interesting uh, presentation. I also would like to add my voice to Bell uh, with regard to the uh, findings of your uh, uh, experiment. So I was also expecting the same finding, which is a short-lived impact on the welfare of uh, individuals from the unconditional cash transfers, uh, because these are people who are uh, extremely poor, who are uh, living below the poverty line. So I'm expecting that they do not use these cash transfers to save but to uh, satisfy their basic needs. That's why I was not expecting uh, the impact of the program to uh, live uh, further than the, the life of the program itself. Uh, but does this mean that uh, an implication of your finding is that it's better to use conditional cash transfers uh, to have uh, sustainable effects on the welfare of the recipients of the program uh, when they are asked to uh, uh, try to improve their level of human development, to, to go to schools, to uh, uh, things that will improve their productivity later on and will uh, affect positively their levels of income. Uh, 
uh, but in this case, the, 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 the time span for comparing um, the effect should not just be six months. It should be longer than this to account for the fact that uh, the effect of investing in, in skills uh, will take longer time to materialize. Yeah, thank you, Onur. Thank you. Uh, I see another hand. This is Ali. Ali, this is a new yeah, hand question. raising? Yeah, or this uh, is from the previous session? No, a new hand. Uh, okay, Ali. Yeah. Very quick comment following your uh, comments, actually. So basically, in Lebanon, I, I, I know exactly the situation of, of uh, particularly Syrian refugees. A large number of them, they do really saving. They save. They part, they work in the informal sector as concierge or whatever, and they, they do they do work. Uh, I had uh, explicit experience with international organization and working with refugees uh, to to go through this type of uh, of uh, issues. So you want to help to provide cash assistance, and actually uh, many of them they use cash assistance to to have some houses and <laughs> they build houses in their uh, home country. So just a quick observation uh, from the context here, from, uh, from the ground. Thank you. Uh, All right. All right. Uh, Anur? Yeah. yeah, I can, maybe I start with your comments. Thank you so much. This is, uh, this is very uh, useful. So, I mean, you're right about that, you know, when we showed these results to implementing agencies, they were not surprised either. They said, you know, these are temporary, uh, 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 these are cash transfers that, that aim te for temporary relief and emergency cash. So uh, why would we expect uh, longer term effects beyond the assistance cycle? Well, if you look at the implementation, I mean, the implementation is identical to any kind of anti-poverty program around the world. You know, like there's no, I mean, you can name it differently, but this is how, how things work. Like you, it's, it's basically transparent and easy to implement for, for that specific reason, you just provide cash. And that in that aspect, it doesn't change. So the implementation is identical. Um, and if you think about the permanent income hypothesis, you know, like we we know that most uh, uh, most households uh, rely on expensive credit, and and sometimes this goes all the way to you know uh, abusive relationship with the landlords and 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 people that they they uh, they borrow money and so on. So borrowing is a big issue, and the and the and you know and the interest rates that they face are substantially higher compared to. Uh, compared to say, you know, equivalent income, even the Lebanese population. So in that sense, you know, you would expect this, these cash transfers to, to actually uh, push them to save and smooth over at least over one year or two years, you know, after the program ends. Uh, and that was the kind of like the idea that we were, we were going uh, after. Uh, we do know that, I mean, we don't have a lot of data on on productive assets and and to what extent these these transfers can be used for business development or like for productive purposes that will create like further income. Uh, we don't have much data on that, uh, but even from the savings perspectives, we would expect these to 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 provide relief on on the borrowing constraints that these families are severely facing because they have almost no access to the uh, formal credit markets uh, in. Uh, in the host country, and that's from our perspective, that's not expected. You know, that's why it was it was a little more surprising uh, for us not to see even all these effects dissipate even six months at six months. Um, and let me. Uh, so we have data. So you you said you know almost all of all of the refugees are receiving assistance, and 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 you know these uh, so these programs might not actually create enough variation, if my understanding is is correct uh well the thing is that we have data on the or any kinds of assistance that that a family receives in our data set and you can see the substantial jump still because the programs that we're looking at there is no other program that provides as uh as transfer value was as as much as these two that that we like we're looking at the two major uh programs and even you add up all the assistance that the families are receiving you know this creates so for, sort of like first stage uh first stage uh, variation. Uh, and the score and the learning issue, like we have like a, a battery of tests that we, we show that actually 
because we're looking at this tiny, tiny uh, uh, bandwidth around the eligibility threshold for a family to be able to learn and then become accessible from one side to the other side of the threshold is virtually impossible. And we have like a battery of tests that we, uh, that we show in the data to kind of uh, support that. Uh, for Sarah's comment on longer time, I think you're right. Uh, the one issue we had is that, you know, we can only look at two years back because of data, data constraints. Uh, otherwise, uh, our initial uh, kind of purpose was to look at a longer term effects, but, but it turned out that, you know, we don't have enough data to kind of have the statistical power to be able to say anything. But, but this is an excellent uh, kind of comment for, for, uh, for future work. Uh, for Ali's comments, you know, uh, having like other businesses like which related to Syria and, and you know, sending remittances or, or doing like non-traditional way of saving uh, in the home country. Uh, we don't have, you know, we only have like we, we kind of go over the, the, the sort, of, sort of the expenditure and then the regular savings that families have. So there are kind of like data constraint on, on, on that side, too. So thank you so much uh, again for your comments. And let me know if I if I missed to cover anything. No, no, you are good. Thank you, thank you very much, Unos. Thank you very much. Now we have the third and last presentation: the gender gap in political participation evidence from MENA region. We have Ali Fati and Yara Sleiman. Ali, you are presenting. Yes. Okay, the floor is yours. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Abidal. Can you see my slides? Yes. Yes, we can. Yeah, so uh, first of all, I would like to thank ERF for this opportunity again to present our work in this excellent uh, uh, regional conference. So uh, Ali Fouki, Associate Professor of Economics from Lebanese American University, Beirut. Uh, so uh, this is a joint work with uh, Sarah Suleiman from Institute of Global uh, Prosperity at UC uh, UCL. So basically in this paper, uh, what we do, uh, we investigate the gender difference in political participation across the MENA region. Uh, we uh, want to uh, distinguish between uh, uh, formal institutions or institu two types of institutions, institutional and non-institutional political participation. Um, and the central question is that we evaluate whether the gender gap uh, in both uh, types or forms is um, generated by demographic uh, and non-demographic uh, basic socioeconomic characteristics. And uh, second, uh, to assess whether the variables under investigation uh, differ between um, uh, men and women uh, using two types of um, uh, methodology. So basically, if we go to, uh, uh, we have limited 15 minutes. So uh, what, uh, what we observe in the MENA region looking into different types of um, uh, status facts. So uh, an interesting observation uh, in Zamina region, if we look into the global gender gap index um, uh, in 2020, so basically it stands at a low uh, value around uh, 61%. This is the lowest uh, uh, value among all geoeconomic region, even though there was a, a, um, uh, uh, some, some improvement between 19, uh, between um, 2019 and 2020 by 0.5%. And uh, if uh, uh, they mentioned also in the report, so given this rate of progress, so uh, to close the gap uh, between uh, ma male and female, uh, it, they include a number of uh, uh, indicators here. So uh, discrepancies uh, between male and females in areas uh, for health, education, attainment, economic participation, and so on, it will take uh, 150 years to uh, close uh, the gap. So uh, we have some uh, important observations, uh, definitely. For example, uh, the seats of females in, uh, uh, held by Arab women in uh, parliament. So it's around 19% based on World Economic Forum uh, from uh, 2019. So uh, we, what we want to do, uh, uh, so uh, we raise that question about a particularly political um, uh, participation and to uh, provide novel evidence to highlight the difference uh, between or the difference uh, that may exist across gender. So uh, the contribution of this paper can be split into two categories. So basically we want to go beyond 
formal and the classical classification of institution. So we have um, uh, most of the study focus on institutional context where uh, examining forms such as um, party membership, electoral participation, working on campaigns, and basically uh, providing uh, uh, now non-institutional uh, 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 dimension uh, in order to compare between the two types of political participation uh, and will provide ad, uh, additional evidence. Uh, so a second uh, contribution, existing uh, studies are mostly dominated uh, across developed uh, countries. Uh, evidence from MENA countries are a bit old and uh, the empirical uh, uh, studies and uh, uh, using old data uh, that may be hard to put uh, uh, the evidence or the results in the context of uh, Arab Spring. So uh, studying uh, or uh, focusing on the case of MENA region will allow us to assess whether the results and assumptions uh, based on developed countries or even less developed countries uh, uh, on an institution may hold for the MENA region. So basically we ask two types of questions uh, that are uh, correlated and we have interrelationship between the two. So first we assess whether there is a persistent gender gap in both institutional and non-institutional uh, forms. And second, we evaluate whether variables influencing political participation uh, affect male, uh, men and women differently. So uh, given the importance of a political and civic en engagement in the region following the Arab Spring uh, uh, uprising. So evaluating such inequality is essential for policy uh, makers. Uh, so to the best of our knowledge, very few studies have assessed the uh, proponent research questions in the context of political tr transformations resulted from the Arab uh, Spring. So um, in terms of definition, uh, to make it uh, explicit and to avoid having broad definition of political participation. So we refer to political participation as actions conducted by citizens in an attempt to impact decision making. Uh, so we exclude uh, involuntary uh, participation, political attitude, uh, school uh, uh, clubs or family engagement. We include actions carried out by citizens like I mentioned, an attempt to influence political uh, uh, decision uh, making. So by doing so, we omit all involuntary participation, school, club, engagement, uh, etc. So uh, basically here, uh, we have two forms of participation, institutional, it, uh, long established actions uh, who central principle is government representation. So basically, uh, typically includes voting, a party membership, uh, running for office, uh, working on political uh, campaigns, non-institutional participations. So we have less conventional modes of participation. Uh, so they are classified into two uh, categories. So we have collective activism, uh, protest, participation in demonstrations, uh, occupying buildings. Uh, these are the main uh, components. Uh, uh, private activism, uh, signing petitions, uh, joining by courts, uh, internet political comments, and uh, other actions under uh, private uh, activism. So uh, this is a definition we restricted uh, to in our paper that will be reflected later in our, uh, in our uh, uh, research frame and our definition of dependent variables. So now I will go a bit, uh, I want to skip some parts here so basically, uh, gender dif difference in political uh, uh, participation. So existing studies and the scholars from different uh, uh, regions. So uh, suggest difference, uh, gender difference in political engagement might be rooted in a, a divergent uh, preference, All right? So for example, women in the United States uh, are found to favor social movements over radical actions so we have uh, established uh, evidence regarding the gender difference and the insights uh, behind gender difference in political participation. So for instance, also uh, prior evaluations from 
uh, euro using larger scale surveys uh, suggests that dependence of political engagement on, uh, for example, on resource endowments, uh, where uh, men are more likely to engage in activities that require more resources like institutional and collective forms. So however, women may be pushed to specialize in private forms, which do not strain their uh, relatively limited resources and are more easily incorporated in their daily uh, lives. As a result, it will increase the gap. Um, so uh, basically, uh, also we have results from uh, a new democracies in um, uh, East Europe. So consistent gender gap across uh, all forms, institutional, uh, collective, and the private. And basically, uh, it's important to note that for the targeted group in our paper, so basically the institutional engagement gap tends to be less pronounced in newly established uh, uh, democracies, if you want, uh, following the uh, Arab Spring uprising. So in this context, taking into account the Arab transformations, so uh, gender gaps in voting and party membership may be less manifest, uh, manifested as they are regarded as safer uh, arenas for females compared to males. Uh, so these are some uh, common observations from uh, literature review regarding uh, gender difference in political participation. So in this uh, uh, paper, we formulate four hypotheses as a result from a previous slide. So hypothesis number one, the institutional participation gender gap favors men, men and is less pronounced than non-institutional gap. And second hypothesis, the non-institutional participation, uh, second form of political participation, gender gap favors men, but is less pronounced for private activism than collective activism. And basically, uh, sources of uh, uh, participation uh, f uh, with the gender gap. Uh, basically, now I'm trying to uh, formulate the theoretical insights or argument for the selection of our uh, covariates. So, uh, uh, starting with socioeconomic resources or characteristics, so higher levels of participation as uh, resource endowment increase, income. Uh, uh, and control over income, uh, education, employment status, uh, uh, may affect uh, potential uh, resources, uh, time, and the skills avail uh, available for participation, uh, 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 increasing the cap, allowing uh, uh, men to participate more. We include marriage, age, uh, for instance, uh, affect uh, uh, skills and uh, knowledge acquisition that will be uh, higher for uh, elderly workers and will create this gap compared to a young generation. Uh, we also uh, use uh, a political attitude, we'll mention in a bit. Uh, so basically, based on socioeconomic characteristics, we derive our hypothesis uh, number three. So uh, with increasing socioeconomic resources, both uh, men and women will participate more politically. So, uh, uh, testing the null hypothesis if we reject it. So this effect is, uh, uh, we assume is stronger for men than for women. Adding the set second group of covariates related to political attitudes, we have four uh, uh, characteristics. So uh, an individual politically held beliefs are a strong indicator for political engagement. Uh, so we observe uh, uh, in a number of studies, positive correlation between political attitudes and participation in Arab uh, world. Uh, so we beside a number of uh, arguments. So this will lead us to derive our uh, fourth hypothesis as levels of political trust, uh, interest, uh, engagement, importance as a perception for that person and democratic uh, deficit increase, political participation will increase. So this effect- Ali, you've got five, five minutes, five yes. minutes. Yeah, thank you. So uh, this is stronger among uh, men. So this concludes part number one. Let's move into the research frame. Uh, so basically we use a word value survey, uh, wave six, uh, because data uh, was com uh, more complete with low number of uh, missing values for 
2010-2014, we used uh, 10 um, uh, MENA countries, uh, resulted into uh, 12,000 as number of observation. Um, uh, our, uh, our variables are defined uh, as follows, are dependent variables, institutional participation. So uh, we build a proxy based on uh, party membership and uh, electoral behavior. On, this is an order of variable on a scale from zero to two. Uh, private activism is built based on petition by code uh, variable. And finally, the second uh, uh, form of non-institutional uh, participation, uh, collective activism is based on demonstrations and strikes. We take the two to build our collective activism and it is translated also into a normal uh, variable. So let me skip this part. This is the basic socioeconomic characteristics and uh, the basic uh, political attitude uh, variables, they are all qualitative with exception uh, number of uh, children, uh, age uh, and uh, uh, income. Uh, summary statistics, uh, basically here what you are observing. So the table reports a mean value for our variables. So basically what uh, uh, if we look into the uh, t-test for the two sample tests, uh, we are obtaining significant uh, results. So uh, briefly, uh, they show that uh, the mean comparison shows significant gender difference for the dependent variables because they are uh, statistically significant. Uh, similar, when we look into mean comparison for uh, political attitude, it is significant for political importance. While political trust, political interest, democracy deficit are uh, not significant. So the mean comparison shows a significant gender for a uh, private uh, political uh, activities. Uh, so this is uh, um, contradicts, uh, actually it was surprising the literature re review for developed economies. Uh, let me go to empirical results. No need to go through this one. We use an ordered logic uh, model. We have ordinary scale and uh, uh, one and second, we use a sure regression in order to compare between the two samples. So in one, we use uh, ordinary logic model uh, where we pull um, our data for uh, male and female. And uh, we uh, use the odds ratio uh, defined as the probability that the dependent variable has a certain uh, outcome. Right. So uh, regarding uh, so this is when we compare male and female. So results. So basically what we are observing, uh, if we look into the first one for uh, female. So first, when moving from the simple model with only one variable uh, gender to the second one colon, we add socioeconomic to the third one, the uh, complete uh, model. So it leads to a reduction in the participation uh, gender gap. So it's negative. So below one. Uh, female participate less. So there is a, um, and it is statistically uh, significant, all right? So uh, this is in line with hypothesis one and hypothesis uh, two. So uh, additional observation here, uh, the general picture from this table, uh, it points to a positive correlation between socioeconomic resources and uh, political participation with a few exceptions. So here, very, really a few exceptions like this one, a number of children. So these are the uh, uh, main overview. So uh, um, let me go now to the results by, uh, so by a political participation. So using sure regression, similarly unrelated uh, regression. Uh, so basically what you are observing uh, among the, among the socioeconomic characteristics, so there is significant differences that was detected in educational attainment and employment status. Uh, interestingly, uh, being employed is positively and significantly correlated with higher uh, political uh, participation across non-institutional uh, forms for women, uh, but has no significant uh, impact uh, for men. So uh, uh, if we relate this one with hypothesis number three, so uh, here, uh, effect sizes for this variable run opposite to the hypoth hypothesis number three, right? Uh, basically. So uh, also we run the results uh, by country. Uh, so 
uh, two main uh, patterns emerge. Uh, first, uh, some gender gaps disappear when examined at country uh, level. And uh, uh, second, where a gender gap does exist, the gap favors men in the majority of cases. So these are the two main uh, observations emerged from results by country. So also, uh, what we did uh, as a final assessment, uh, we run the model by political uh, regime type. So here we differentiate between high authoritarian uh, regime, low authoritarian, and hybrid model. So we use uh, the, the average uh, democracy index for the same year. And basically, uh, they classify countries using electoral process and uh, pluralism is uh, the functioning of government. So basically, the average of our sample uh, range between 2.7 and 5.3, so indicating low participation in all cases. But when looking into the results, we observe, this is a final uh, finding, so the highest gender uh, gap participation among the grouping across institutional and the private participation for. Uh, so basically, the lowest participation gap for non-institutional engagement uh, is observed for the hybrid regime uh, countries. Uh, so uh, conclude, uh, some, implic some uh, implications for uh, policy makers or policy implications. So uh, political uh, decision making should be if, if a reflection of all uh, participation forms. And uh, policies uh, aim to promote the participation of women in the labor market and their economic participation are imperative. So this is, uh, yani we hope. But uh, fully participating uh, women in the uh, life, in the political participation may be hard at this uh, stage. So it may be uh, an idea for policymakers to start uh, with engaging more women and um, so targeting the implicit interconnected uh, reduce uh, uh, barriers and constraints that keep women out of uh, uh, politics, domestic burdens, uh, child care policies, a more flexible uh, work arrangement, let's say uh, cultural barriers and uh, so on. So we'll, I'll stop here and thank you for uh, listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ali. Yeah. Okay, I will do my part here. Just okay. I will just share the share my screen. Okay. Right. So uh, the objective of the research it's multiple. One is to investigate the extent of gender gap in 10 main Arab countries and explore how demographic and socioeconomic characteristics mediate um, an existing gender gap. Um, the paper also highlights different aspects. So this is in terms of what type of political uh, participation they uh, test the institutional uh, and uh, uh, uninstitutional participation. Uh, in terms of methodology, they utilize ordered logic uh, model, SUR type of model. The paper shows that demographic so and socioeconomic characteristics do explain part of the gender gap. Uh, checking the tables, it was only with respect to uh, institutional participation. Uh, the coefficient uh, on institutional uh, participation, I'm sorry, the coefficient of uh, gender gap in the institutional participation model was uh did not change uh, once the other controls were added the paper then split the sample into men and women findings show differential effect across type of political participation um also when running the model separately for each country gender gap existed only for us uh, for a, a part of the countries in the model in the sample i'm sorry the paper Further investigate a gender gap in political participation, taking into account the type of political regime, grouping them into high, low, and hybrid authoritarian countries. The findings show that gender gap exists across the board with different magnitudes of the coefficient. 
my comments, I thought the topic was interesting, mainly in the light of uh, political, also political changes taking part in many Arab countries after the Arab Spring, uh, but I think it, it needs some revision, um, mainly with respect to contribution as well as empirical model. And here I explain uh, why and how. Uh, contribution to the literature. Um, so the, the authors relied on, uh, on the little research that has been done in the MENA countries. Um, and they regarded mostly that as a contribution for the paper. That's fine, but I, I guess we, you, you will need to explain what is special about these countries. If there is an additional stories that we cannot extract out of the other countries. Uh, uh, but at the end, the findings are you know, similar and not deviating much from the existing literature. Um, in terms of the empirical modeling, um, the model which pulled all the countries, um, I'm not sure if it's well specified because you're pulling different countries into one model, like uh, in terms of you know, the type of political regime, Jordan and Morocco are monarchies, Lebanon regime is highly um, you know, sectarian, uh, you know, pulling all observation with, without controlling for these differences might produce a biased estimate. So in this case, I'm, um, I'm suggesting to add a uh, counter fixed effect to the, to the model. This will, you know, absorb all these differences and make your findings more robust. Uh, you also have, uh, I think, simultaneity between the mediating factors, how you call them, the socioeconomic variables like income, political <clears throat> attitude, these are not exogenous to the extent of uh, political uh, uh, participation. You know, uh, you know if in, in countries where uh, uh, political participation is more extensive, you would see that they, are, they have better institutions, maybe that affecting the economic conditions and maybe the income level would be higher in this country relative to other countries with you know, more of uh, dictator dictatorship as a type of uh, political regime. So uh, to me, this is more of, uh, of correlation and uh, findings that you guys uh, uh, documented. And, and this, to some extent, limit the policy implications of the findings. Uh, the paper also utilizes the uh, SUM model, but I'm, I'm not sure about the justifications. I mean, they, they need to provide enough uh, rationale as why their terms of the models are correlated. Also, with the measuring political participation, well, the uh, you know it's it's the, uh, the MENA countries, the, the Arab countries are to some extent unique. The fact that you find some people not uh, voting, for example, some election, not because they are uh, politically idle in many instances, because they, they don't recognize the, um, um, the poli existing political system and to them it's mostly a superficial. So I think care should be taken in to uh, you know, broaden the reflections and uh, uh, the interpretation of uh, the results. And I think uh, just, you know, you, you need to be transparent about this issue and maybe just uh, address it in the paper. Um, uh, at the level of descriptive analysis, I encourage the, encourage the authors to provide descriptive statistics per country, because we have, you know, lots of differences and uh, providing descriptive uh, statistics of the variables in the model per each country would, you know, give the readers more information about the context. Uh, I think I like the model that separate the uh, separate the sample into uh, into countries, right? Because then you, you lose the concern of pulling different countries into one model. But then you'll have to explain why uh, the results show gender gap in some countries, but does not in don't in uh, in other models. Uh, I mean, in, in other models, that, does that mean uh, there is I mean, uh, controlling for all? observed socioeconomic conditions, no gap exists. I mean, this is a little bit far from the reality, mainly in Arab countries. Um, all right. 
uh, and I think, yeah, th these are the, these are my comments. Uh, before giving you the chance, Ali, to address them. And by the way, uh, Hind, uh, I'm sorry, Hoda will, will send you my comments written, like uh, I believe afterward, and afterward, uh, once we are done from this presentation. So you'll have them all written. Uh, Sarah, do you have a question? Uh, actually, yes, a very quick one. So yeah. uh, thank you very much, Ali. It's a really interesting presentation. And uh, I totally agree with you that uh, in, in countries where there is gender discrimination, uh, in order to accurately measure the gender gap with respect to political participation, it should not be through the institutional uh, participation because it is already flawed. So uh, a non-institutional measure will be the, 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 the correct measure. However, uh, I do not totally agree with the, um, your measure of the non-institutional participation, which is the private versus the collective uh, activism. Because I believe that for women, uh, both of them, both the private and the collective activism, uh, they were, require a lot of time and effort in order for uh, the woman to participate politically uh, through these two mechanisms, uh, which will uh, prevent uh, the woman from politically participating. So I'm suggesting another measure, which another non-institutional measure, which is um, another channel by which women can politically participate uh, and which could be a good measure for you, like uh, women's participation through social media and uh, the comments that they write on the social media that are uh, relevant to politics. I think this does not require any time or effort uh, and could be a, a real measure of the gender gap, because I would expect that uh, uh, in this case, uh, the gender gap will be shrinking with respect to the participation of women politically on the social media platforms. Yeah, thank you, Ali, that's it. Thank you, Sarah. Other questions from the floor? Okay, Ali, a couple yeah. of minutes to address the questions if you wanted. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, uh, Bilal, for your uh, really um, important comments and observations and for Sarah. So this is really timely because we received recently R&R &R, uh, for this paper uh, uh, and uh, we didn't start working because it's recent and uh, the deadline is uh, far a bit. But I agree uh, actually for uh, the literature review to expand it a bit. Uh, we were, uh, we wanted to to focus on specific elements uh, from literature review, but I agree. So uh, to uh, conceptualize the paper uh, from different perspective in literature review, I totally agree. Uh, regarding the empirical work um, uh, in pooling, um, uh, when pooling the country, so most likely we will eliminate this table because the fixed effect uh, shows uh, substantial uh, changes across uh, uh, columns. So most likely we'll go by country with, and to elaborate more on um, results by country or regime type, uh, because we tried recently country fixed effect indeed. Yeah. Um, so for simult uh, simultaneity uh, problem uh, between uh, that may exist in the model. So what we are trying to do is to uh, relax the use of causality, causation, and to mention it in, a, in the paper. I agree that the, the status of socioeconomic may encourage more uh, people or uh, some categories to participate more. As a result, there is inverse uh, relationship. Uh, so the descriptive statistics uh, also, uh, we had it in, in all the draft, we had it, but it was too long, the paper turned out to be very long and we eliminated at the end of the day. So we'll see now the new paper, how it's the shape will, uh, because I agree, I had a presentation this uh, morning on another paper on Egypt and African economic society. So we raised the issue about uh, by country. On, uh, online appendix, Ali, online appendix. Yeah, this, uh, because it's interesting to compare between countries, I totally agree when uh, uh, pulling the country, there is an issue, and especially it's, uh, yani, cross-sectional data and uh, the, the establishment of causality or uh, causal effect, it's hard. 
uh, to convince. Uh, regarding Sarah comments, um, basically, uh, we were searching for alternative uh, definition for uh, institutions. And this is, is a main comment we received from the ERF. Um, we explore one, but when we did the revision, we didn't have time uh, to resubmit the paper. This is among our agenda to expand the definition of uh, why, of political participation. Because I totally agree regarding women, if you have barriers and regardless uh, the type of, of uh, institutions, you may not be able uh, to participate. The social media, if uh, there is a proxy or index, it's really interesting where it gives more uh, flexibility in terms of uh, time. So thank you so much for your constructive uh, comments and observations. Thank you very much, Ali. Uh, I don't see other questions. I'd like to thank you all very much, the presenters, for their very nice presentations and for the audience as well. And I wonder if Shireen would like to add, if before we leave. I would like to add my thanks to yours and to thank you personally for a job exceptionally well done as a discussion. You're welcome. Chairman as a moderator as well. Really, thank you. No um, the discussions were very rich, much, much, much appreciated. I'd like to make three announcements. One is that, yes, Hoda will be in touch with you uh, for the um, discussions comments so that you can take them on board and submit for the ERF working paper series. Uh, we'd also like to invite you to uh, present um, a policy article for the forum, should you wish, uh, to come along the same timing with the working papers to ensure further outreach. And third is to bring to your attention um, that there's going to be a particular special panel on conflict related matters on the 10th of um, June, so that's next Thursday, and it would be reflecting on the um, ERF program in that area, so you may wish to pencil that in particularly for your agenda. And all the details are actually on the website and in the agenda. And again, thank you warmly and have a great weekend. Thanks ever so much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you very much, Shireen. And thanks to everyone. Have a thank good weekend you. and stay thank safe. You. Thank, thank you very much. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye